All right, welcome everyone. As noted, this is being supported by the Learning Analytics Learning Network uh, Initiative, uh, sponsored by University of Texas Arlington, as well as University of South Australia, and also with the Master of Science in Learning Analytics, which is being coordinated by uh, University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. There's an important conversation going on that many of you are aware of, engaged in, and continually, I assume, impacted by as well, which is how is it that we gain insight into the human condition? Now, if you go back 100 and some years ago when we were talking, 150 years ago when things like introspection were prominent, we were trying to get at cognitive states of individuals. We were trying to get to the point where we understood what was happening when someone was thinking or engaged in thinking processes. But unfortunately, introspection had a lot of ambiguity to it. There was a lot of uncertainty. My rating of a certain experience may not match your rating of a comparable experience. And there was no way to actually resolve those two. In response, psychology as a field moved large scale into some version of what we would now refer to as behaviorism. And the intent and the motivation is completely understandable, which is you wanted to drive a, uh, a way of more empirically evaluating and shaping human behavior and what's happening as individuals engage in any number of activities just related to life. There were some difficulties with that framework as well, which was quite often we were unable to account for some of the uh, hidden experiences of learning, the things that we're not necessarily even conscious of all the time. And it didn't capture sort of the full spectrum of, of what we do in daily lives. It was fantastically effective at shaping and changing and directing behavior, but it wasn't as effective at capturing a range of related processes and that, in, that are often not fully conscious, but that do shape our behavior and our actions. So in response, cognitive science, the way many of us know it today, kind of launched and gained significant traction over a fairly short period of time. An interesting paper in Nature a number of months, or actually a number of years ago, that looked at you know, what happened to cognitive science. How did this field that was supposed to be interdisciplinary drawing from psychology and philosophy and, and uh, in a range of related disciplines, including computer science at some level, you know, did it reach its potential in the short version as well? Not really. It generally ended up sitting just within psychology when it was intended to be multidisciplinary. More recently, there is a significant opportunity through the use of data. And that's why we are here, which is part of our argument is that some of the things that we have achieved experimentally or understood experimentally can now be understood through data and through data capture and through the use of large scale interactions as individuals are active in social media as they're interactive in classroom experiences or Mechanical Turk or whatever platform you're using. So our argument then is there's something about data that is worth exploring from the lens of psychology researchers and psychologists in general. And in the case of learning analytics, uh, individuals or people with a background or a home in learning analytics, there are things that we can learn around the constructs and the experimental designs that are more prominently used in cognitive science or psychology in general. With that said, I'm not going to waste too much time because we have a pretty packed agenda of things to be done today. And so there's a lot of things that we're going to be working on over the next uh, probably hour and a bit. And we're going to kick right off with the first presenter. Um, we have Caitlin Mills. If any of you are interested, I'll drop the link in, but you can click on the, the general CDs and the bios. I won't bother with the reading because you all have fingers and can Google. Um, but let me throw this over to you, Caitlin. Feel free to start sharing just so everyone's aware. We're running 15 minutes per presenter. Um, there generally be about 10 to 12, some cases a little longer, of presentations with opportunities for questions. If you have questions, feel free to ask them in the uh, Q&A environment, and I will respond and direct those at that time. Caitlin, welcome here. Over to you. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again for organizing this, uh, George and Justin. Excited to hear what our, everyone has to uh, say. Um, I guess kind of going off of what, what George was just mentioning, um, I kind of, I kind of re, I was going to say making cognition visible, making cognition visible. And I kind of started making this talk and decided to go a slightly different route, um, which is to kind of figure out how to use uh, data, all the data that's accessible to us, but not let go of the idea of exploring causal mechanisms through um, carefully designed experiments and trying to kind of uh, merge those approaches together a little bit. So I thought I would start off um, by just going back to the, the definition of learning analytics, um, which George, I guess, if, if, is from you in 2011 and uh, perhaps intentionally was written quite broadly uh, as the measurement, collection, and analysis and reporting of data 
um, about learners in their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. So this is quite broad, um, but but I do think you know it, it has this inherent relationship with psychology, where one of the things that we need to understand is what is happening cognitively during learning. So how do, how does features of the learning environment, the learning environment design, affect our cognition and affect, and then how does our cognition and affect affect how you know what we end up learning. Um, one of the issues with this, or, or one of the challenges, is that we often really can't observe these constructs. Uh, so even if we have some trace data accessible to us, it can be often hard to map the trace data to these cognitive or affective constructs. So these are things like engagement, affect, attention, that we know are important, but we don't always know how to measure them or what is actually influencing them. So, you know, there's been a, a quite a recent shift, like big data opens new doors, and this is wonderful. Um, we should we should certainly you know go with this approach, um, but it, but it but by itself, if we don't use sort of this like multi method approach, by itself it doesn't address the me like the mechanisms or the or the causality uh, uh, in most cases. Um, so we have quite a bit of trace data, and oftentimes we're using this sort of post hoc model things like cognitive affective states. So we can really take this like complex system with all the data that we have and get a sense of the relationships, which is opened a lot of doors, we, you know, has, has been massively helpful in, in many fields, including learning analytics. But one of the sort of questions then is, even if we use like an interpretable machine learning model, for example, we're often still sort of stuck at this correlational in nature place. So as an example, my machine learning model might suggest that, oh, when students are, you know, using this dashboard more, it's going to be better predictive of the grades. This is the feature that I know is driving this prediction, and that that model alone has a lot of um, importance. It, it could be used, right? But we don't know why. So there might be this third variable there, such as motivation, where students who are more motivated may just use any tools available to them more, and students who are more motivated might just get higher grades. So we're not actually getting at what is the what is the mechanism here. Similarly. There's been a ton of really interesting work, which is also really important to, to, to keep doing, where we look at different tools and features and how they may improve the learning environment. Um, so, you know, although this is really helpful and we know that various tools are working, so we know they may improve engagement, they may improve learning, oftentimes we still don't know why they're improving it. So, um, for example, we may have a dashboard that has multiple features on it but it can be hard to isolate which one is helping. So it may be the case that one of them is really driving student engagement through increased attention and, and so forth. But without isolating them, we don't actually know what the mechanistic uh, uh, you know, explanation is for this. So here I'll make a case um, that things like theoretically driven experimental manipulations, where we attempt to actually isolate and, and look at how and why we observe these changes might be a, an approach that, uh, may not be as popular right now in learning analytics, but, but taken together with these big data approaches and with these other quantitative and qualitative approaches, we might have a fuller picture that is both in practice and um, sort of informing our theories as well. And I just wanna make sure that, that I'm not being uh, misheard here. I don't think that we should abandon the big data approach and so forth uh, for experimental manipulations. I actually see this as a very much like a, a complementary way to develop mechanistic theories that inform our design and practice. So I'll just give you one example um, from my own work, which uh, my background is in cognitive psychology. Um, right now I'm an assistant professor at UNH in cognitive psychology. And uh, the construct that I'll focus on is, is this idea of mind wandering. So I'll define mind wandering today um, as essentially when a student is thinking about something unrelated to uh, their learning environment. And um, one of the questions that I've really thought about a lot is, so we know that mind wandering almost always has a negative relationship with learning or co and comprehension. So what, what are we gonna do about it? Because no matter how many experimental manipulations we test, you're never gonna get rid of it. It's gonna happen. And, and in fact, we probably want it to happen, right? Because it has a lot of good benefits, but like when it happens, is there a way we can help students to make sure that that doesn't have any negative effects? So, Let's assume we have taken this trace data approach and we are able to build some machine learning model of mind wandering. So say in, in this context reading, say when a student is reading um, on, on a computer, 
we can make some reasonable prediction about whether or not they are on or off task. So the question is, what, what do we do about it now? Um, we know that from like the theoretical perspective on why mind wandering can have this negative effect on learning is because essentially you are uh, you you have these gaps that arise in what you're learning. So say you're reading, you miss a few pages of text, and then you try to keep reading. Well, missing those few pages of text might have introduced these gaps in your mental model or situation model of the text to where now it has this cascading effect. You're not able to make these bridging inferences across parts of the text so that you really have a full picture of what's happening, right? So what do we do about that? that that's sort of the, the current theory. What can we actually do about it? So the idea is that what if we intervene in real time, the second that we think that mind wandering has, has come about in order to improve comprehension in that moment to sort of get rid of those cascading effects. The question though, that, that, that you know, that's quite hard, but I think is important for us to think about is if we develop these detectors, we have these theories, what is the best way to test if it's actually working in this um, sort of more like isolated approach? And um, here I'll kind of give you an example of what we ended up doing. So let's say we have this detector and we can build an intervention that we think theoretically should work. So we'll have people read, we're checking their eye gaze, and if they're not mind wandering, great. There's no gaps that have come up so they can keep reading. That's great. If we do think they're mind wandering though, let's ask them to, to, to explain the text to us. And this is you know, based on Danielle's work who, who will speak later about things like self-explanation being really effective strategies. If you ask people to explain something, they can identify the gaps in their knowledge. Um, and so then if, they're, if they answer the question incorrectly, we still don't think they have a gap though, right? So they get to keep reading. If they answer it incorrectly though, we're like, okay, why don't you go reread that part of the text so that you can fill in your gap before you keep reading? So then they'll come back to the question and then eventually they'll get to keep reading either way. So this is a sort of idea based on the, the theory of mind wondering about why, like how we might be able to help it. But again, we go back to how do we test this experimentally, right? How do we isolate if this intervention is actually working? What we ended up doing is um, using a yoked control design, which is essentially where Two people are matched they get the exact same experience and in this case the person in blue for example they're going to get a, a mind wandering intervention when they need it so when the detector thinks that they're off task they're going to get it sort of like a just in time they need this right now whereas the person in white their sort of uh, matched counterpart is just going to get it you know more or less randomly tied to when the person in blue got it so let's say person in blue gets it when they need it on pages 7, 13, and 41. We have no idea if person B is mind wandering or not, but they are going to get the exact same experience. And this is because if we just gave someone this intervention, we know it's going to help them, right? Like, you know, Danielle's work and, and other people have really showed that self-explanation is so effective that we can't just compare it to a do nothing because we know that should help them no matter what. So, uh, you know, in reality here, this is just an example that we're really attempting to isolate the effect of the intervention. Is it helpful when it's mind wandering sensitive rather than just giving an intervention like giving a tool to begin with? Um, so I'll just briefly show you, what, you know, what we ended up finding in the study. Here we have the, the, the y-axis is Cohen's D. So this is a standardized effect, uh, effect size. Um, if we look at here, it's a, the mind wandering sensitive minus the yoked control. So positive numbers are gonna mean that the mind wandering sensitive condition did better. And then negative values would mean that the, the control condition actually did better. And then zero would basically mean the means are the exact same. So what we see, we have two different measures uh, of, of comprehension and right after they get done reading, they take a comprehension test. And we basically see that our intervention does not work right after they finish reading, which, which you know, is, is helpful to know. So maybe the self explanations are, are powerful, so powerful for the um, control condition that, you know, they're, they're sort of performing above and beyond the, the mind wandering sensitive condition. However, what's interesting is that after a week long delay, so they leave the lab and after a week long delay, take another comprehension test. And we see on both measures of shallow comprehension and deep comprehension, we see that our mind wandering sensitive intervention is actually doing much better. So by isolating this, um, sort of effect is like we see that it, it that they got it when they needed it. It's not just that they got it, they got the chance to practice self-explanation. It's they, they got it when they may have had a, a gap in their representation. So I'll just sum up here and say that um, 
you know, I really think that learning analytics um, can benefit in terms of like theory and application by using this multi-method approach. I do think that using trace data to model things like cognition, um, cognitive affective states and learning is really helpful, but I also think that doing these really, really carefully controlled isolated experiments can sort of help understand like the mechanisms behind everything. Um, and I think with this mechanistic approach, we not only inform theory, so it's like how can learning analytics come back and help psych psychology theory, but we also, you know, the end goal of all learning analytics, right, is to help teachers and students and how can we do that? And so I really think this multi-method approach um, can benefit from some of the methods that we typically use in, in psychology. So with that, um, I will stop and take any questions and maybe Nigel, you can go ahead and boot me off my screen here. Great, thanks, Caitlin. Um, I think you, you raised some important issues about the balance and the interplay between what we would look at as data methods versus what we would look at traditional experimental design methods. Um, we've got about, uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to just drop them in there, but I'll direct a question to you, Caitlin, while we're waiting. Um, is there a sort of a balance that you think needs to be achieved? Like, are there situations where you're like, oh, look, and we're treating them as a duality, which often, as you noted, isn't the case, but okay, we're taking a data-centric approach where we're not necessarily taking a traditional hypothesis-driven scientific method or experimental design method versus, you know, one where using real-time interventions, as you noted, with, with reading and gaze and, and mind wandering is there a kind of situation or, or a model that you could say how these two pieces would fit together optimally like when would you use one when would you use both from your experience within your own lab a good question that i will be honest i don't know the answer to it i think part of it like from my perspective is where, what you're starting with so if you're if you choose to start like in, in my lab i often start with the more like isolated um, causal approaches and then build out from there. But I think it makes sense to wh whichever one you start with to make sure that you're considering the other one. Cause in my lab, right. I'm not oftentimes maybe not considering the full like complex system cause I'm doing it in an isolated lab. So then I need to know where my, my gap is and fill that in. If I start with the complex system, big data approach, then I need to make sure that I'm checking for the more theoretical, you know, isolated experiments on the backside. So I don't think there's, I guess it's not like a one size fits all. I would just say it, it's helpful to consider where your methodological gaps are and making sure that you don't just keep them as gaps. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Caitlin. We're going to throw it over to Nigel right away. There is a question in the chat area, though, Caitlin, if you have a chance to respond to that, that would be great. Um, Nigel, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for organizing this. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm going to talk today about uh, maybe going a little bit the opposite direction of what Caitlin has just talked about and uh, trying to start from data using machine learning models to eventually support uh, metacognition in computer-based learning. So uh, first I wanted to briefly define uh, what metacognition is, uh, or at least one definition of it, uh, which is thinking about your own thinking. Uh, for example, uh, when you have metacognitive models of cognitive processes and tasks, that's one type of uh, metacognition, metacognitive knowledge. Uh, or feelings and judgments, like you uh, encounter some new information and uh, find it very confusing or feel like you really mastered it, um, or the strategies you take to control your own thinking when you are uh, trying to uh, learn something, for example. Um, so these are all uh, essential for learning, but especially for self-regulated learning, where the, the learners are uh, required to uh, to a certain extent, know what they know and what they don't know and identify gaps in their knowledge uh, so that they can fill those gaps. Um, there's quite a bit of work on supporting self-regulated learning in um, online environments and different ways for doing that. Um, actually, Jacqueline Wong has a, a really wonderful review paper on this that I have relied on heavily. Uh, so I'm very happy to see her in the audience today. Um, but what I want to talk about specifically is the metacognition aspect of self-regulated learning and how we can support that. So there's some work on AI-driven ways to do this. Um, and just in general, um, one way to support uh, self-regulated learning or metacognition or anything, almost anything we want to do in learning is to train some kind of machine learning model, like Caitlin had talked about to predict something that we want to, uh, to intervene based on. Um, so if a very popular application is uh, um, trying to predict when a student will drop out of an online course. 
then presumably we could do something, uh, some kind of intervention to um, help them stay in the course. But uh, generally speaking, knowing what is likely to happen isn't uh, necessarily all that useful for knowing uh, for intervention uh, if we don't know why it is likely to happen. So among the thousands and thousands of, of papers written on predicting whether students will drop out of online courses using machine learning, very few of them actually do something about it. And uh, the ones that do are usually um, a relatively generic kind of intervention, like uh, emailing students or um, asking if they need help on anything, uh, which is a, a great first step, but uh, we would really like to know why this is the case, uh, learning from our data, um, what, uh, what things specifically students might need help on. Uh, so one solution to that is to use an interpretable model, one that doesn't require um, any explanation. You can see from the model itself why uh, predictions were made. And so uh, you can design interventions accordingly. Uh, but there are some constraints on interpretable models. They tend to capture relationships that are linear or at least um, monotonic, like one, one direction, even if it's not a, a linear direction necessarily. Um, and typically they are limited in terms of interactions between predictor variables uh, by uh, by nature of, of uh, being simple enough to, in, to interpret, uh, they also tend to not, uh, not try to discover very complex relationships between variables. But uh, often in learning analytics, we assume that those relationships might exist and we would like to, uh, to learn about them to better uh, understand what students are uh, experiencing. So more typical applications, the less interpretable applications of machine learning in education, uh, apply models that are intended to capture these complex interactions between predictor variables and uh, nonlinear effects of those things. So typically, uh, fairly general purpose models are a good and popular starting point, like random forests and um, gradient boosting um, tree kinds of models are very popular. Um, that uh, capture these kinds of relationships well. Uh, so that's where explainable AI comes into this, or XAI uh, for short. So most machine learning models are very difficult to interpret, but they can still be explained. So there's a, a subtle uh, difference there, uh, which is that a, an explained uh, or an explanation for a model is uh, more like a, a, uh, an approximation a high level approximation of how a model makes a particular decision that it has made, like a, um, a specific prediction for one student. Why did it make that prediction for that student? Um, and an explanation you can actually make to a certain extent, even for a uh, very complicated model. Uh, so almost all machine learning models are explainable. Um, typical explanations answer questions of the model, like how important is some uh, predictor X? Uh, not necessarily that useful to know. Uh, how important was X for making some particular prediction, like for the prediction for whether a student was going to drop out of the course? Uh, or even more specifically, how much and in what direction did some predictor variable X influence the prediction made for uh, some prediction Y? Like, um, how much did the fact that um, the student uh, submitted half of their homework assignments late um, affect the final prediction of their exam score, for example? So that last question is the domain of most uh, modern machine learning explainability methods. Um, and most of them, as a, a quick aside, most of them work by some variation of perturbation and shuffling, which just means um, basically they take this very complex decision space learned by the machine learning model and try to explore little counterfactual questions like what if the, the value of this predictor variable was a little bit higher or a little bit lower, how would that affect the prediction? And then uh, figuring out um, an explanation based on, on that. So there's some methods I won't get into, uh, but if you're interested, these are a few of the uh, latest and greatest uh, popular methods for trying to answer this uh, question of uh, given some complex model, how do we uh, figure out why it made a particular prediction? Um, the one I'll focus on most is the first one up there, SHAP, Shapley Additive Explanations. 
which can answer this uh, critical question, how much did some uh, feature or predictor X influence the prediction made for Y? So we can leverage this to drive uh, interventions given a very uh, complicated machine learning model. Uh, we, can, we can train this model and apply it to uh, make predictions and then uh, generate uh, explanations for each of those predictions uh, and look at only the relevant features. And what I mean by that is the features where we could actually potentially do some kind of intervention. So your model may be very complex and incorporate all sorts of things like um, uh, like background characteristics, like the, the students, uh, I don't know, their standardized test scores or their age or, or something like that. Maybe you don't want to include that, but, uh, but uh, there may be some variables that you can't really do anything about and other variables that you can actually uh, intervene on. Uh, for example, their, their pretest score is in the past. You can't do an intervention to improve their pretest score, but you could intervene to improve their uh, study habits, for example. So we can pick out from the explanations what are the features that we could actually use to do intervention um, and explain the uh, some key outcome, such as grade, and then intervene to try to improve the values of relevant features. Um, so, for example, this is from a pilot study uh, that uh, I did with some of my students, where we, we applied this methodology, um, and this is a graph of the SHAP values for one particular feature. Um, on the x-axis, there is the, uh, the amount of time that um, some specific student spent reading topic six, that's just one of the topics. This is one of the predictor variables that we use, time spent reading per topic. Um, and as you can see, as that time increases, the SHAT value or the effect that um, that time spent has on their predicted outcome increases in kind of a, a sigmoid S-shaped uh, fashion. So this is a nonlinear effect, but one that's very important uh, to understand. If the student is spending only a brief amount of time on the topic, we should encourage them to do more. But if they're spending um, several minutes on the topic, because these are pretty short topics, then uh, we, we wouldn't want to, to encourage that anymore. So the nonlinear nature of this mo model can uncover those things automatically. So the invent intervention should help this student by about 14% in theory. Um, so uh, so we, we, building off what Caitlin said, we ran a, a randomized controlled trial um, as a pilot study to test this out. Um, mixed results, we won't get into that too much. But uh, I also wanted to talk about the other aspect of, of what this is useful for, which is um, it, uncovering hypotheses that can be used to uh, generated to explore with more, uh, more formal inferential kind of statistics. So these explainability methods won't really allow you to make uh, significance claims, but they can uncover hypotheses that we could follow up with um, in, in future experiments uh, with more uh, rigorous experiment designs. And they allow for these kind of complex interactions that we really um, are hoping for and assume may exist in, uh, in the data um, that we can discover via um, illustrations like this um, to, to explore uh, further. So to, to sum up, the machine learning models are very useful for predicting the future, but not for understanding how to change the future. Um, and for that, we can use uh, explanations to learn a little bit more about um, what the model sees in the data. Uh, and uh, maybe also to learn a little bit about um, how students are learning, like looking at those that sigmoid shaped curve uh, to discover a little bit more about the, um, the nonlinear effect of reading time on uh, students' uh, predicted expected performance. So that's all I have for you today. Happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Um, so we have a couple minutes here, about four minutes for questions. Uh, there's two in the chat area. The first one, uh, which you could probably just drop in after we have uh, moved on to Katie. So Katie, you can initiate sharing your slides if you'd like. Um, but this is, could you give a bit more about papers, works, research, and explainable AI applied to the study of self-regulation or metacognition? So I'm not sure if you have an opportunity to just drop a few links in, in response to that. 
Um, the second one was uh, wondering how some of these methods uh, actually work uh, for lay end users. Uh, you feel that they're aimed at developers or researchers. So what are your thoughts on this? And I think that's an interesting point as well, Nigel, that you're probably well aware of, which is as we these, these technologies and methods become more and more complex, you want a broader audience to access them, but you almost need a mediating layer that enables people who don't want to necessarily understand the nuances of what's happening, but want the benefits of what's happening, much like SPSS and other uh, statistical tools have enabled that uh, accessibility to a broader audience. But any thoughts on, on Rianne's question? Yeah, um, these uh, methods are mostly available as Python libraries, which is definitely you know, oriented towards developers and, and researchers. But um, at least as far as Python libraries go, they're pretty easy to use. Um, but they they are still in their in their early stages. I would say this research really um, uh, really kicked off maybe in 2017 or so when uh, the uh, when the shaft explainability method was uh, first discovered. Basically, um, there's been a lot of work on that since, uh, but also uh, work on how to how to explain machine learning models to users because the explanations um, here are very useful for for researchers trying to uh, to really study some effect in detail, but uh, not necessarily comprehensible to all end users or not even addressing the needs that some uh, users might have. Um, so there's like, there's quite a bit of research on that actually. How do you um, explain a model to somebody uh, to different stakeholders who have different interests in the predictions. Um, I would check out the Intelligent User Interfaces Conference, IUI, that um, typically has uh, sort of a lot of interest in that area um, for, for one place to learn more about um, how do you really explain something in a way that people uh, actually understand it. Because you can also explain things in a way that people think they understand. Um, they uh, metacognitively judge themselves to have understood it, but uh, don't actually have a, a good understanding of that. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat also about papers on explainability um, in self-regulated learning. I think this is too new of a field. I don't actually have any good papers to uh, send your way, but hopefully uh, there will be some in the, the next couple of years. And one final question before I throw it over to, to Katie then, and there's a few other ones. Danielle has a question in there as well regarding the amount of data and so on that's required for this type of work uh, that you can respond to via text. But quick question around, especially since you're focusing on metacognition, I think in some ways what's interesting is the the uh, a lot of the AI learning analytics uh, approaches, machine learning as well, addresses the metacognitive aspect of some of the choosing and the decision making and the goal setting and orienting ourselves to curriculum. What are we losing? when we start to automate uh, metacognition, which seems to me to be pretty critical to the human experience of learning and development. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, excellent points. Um, this pilot project was really about supporting uh, students who don't have great metacognitive skills and need, um, you know, need that support at this point in their uh, learning. But uh, long-term, I would hope that we could teach students uh, to engage in that themselves so that they don't need this support. Um, so I have a, a follow-up study that is uh, in the works where we try to um, use the use explanations to uh, to help students identify their own uh, knowledge gaps um, and to give them like short little reflection exercises um, and comparisons of what they think they are missing to what the model thinks that they are missing to hopefully train those kinds of things and get them to be able to uh, make those identifications uh, themselves without the help of the model. Great, thanks, Nigel. Um, we're going to throw it over to Katie. Take it away. Great, thank you. This is the usual. Can you hear me and see my screen? Awesome. Yes, and yes. Fantastic. Cool. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit. I'm using myself as a case study here to sort of talk a little bit about using the combination of psychology and learning analytics, and and in particular in the context of these complex comprehension processes. So. I want to be able to change slides. There we go. Once I can change slides, I can tell you a little about myself. So I'm actually going to go ahead and say I'm very new to learning analytics relative to pretty much everyone else talking today. Um, but I think that that's an exciting thing for me. Um, I have a background in cognitive psychology. And right now I'm an assistant professor of educational psychology in a department of learning sciences. That's a lot of different fields and subfields all kind of rolled into one identity. And I like to 
think that a lot of early career researchers in particular kind of fit this vibe of we're many things and we use a lot of different traditions to think about what we're doing. So I think this is a really important uh, workshop to be thinking about these kinds of things. I will say that I feel like I am a cognitive psychologist who uses all of these different traditions and methods to answer the kinds of questions that I have. Um, and so the questions that I have are roughly around what are the underlying cognitive processes related to reading comprehension? And I wanna clarify that I mean meaningful deep comprehension. I'm talking mostly high school students, college students, adults reading textbooks, legal documents, things like that. Um, and I wanna know how these processes differ across different disciplines and also across uh, different individual differences. In particular, I'm interested in things like how your reading skill impacts your interest or your experience in that particular domain. Um, and those are sort of the more basic work that I do. And then when I think about how I apply it, I'm interested in the kinds of activities and interventions we can do that support comprehension um, and meaningful learning. And of course, thinking about this across discipline and across individual differences, who does it work for? Under what conditions? When is it best to be thinking about these kinds of things? So those are my broad questions. And I wanna talk about two places where I have started to think about how learning analytics can influence what I'm doing. Um, and so one end is thinking about comprehension in science texts and the other is how we understand literary works. So I'm gonna just go in a bunch of different directions. Um, there's been a lot of work in science around explanation strategies. I was hoping Caitlin might say something about this already. So she saved me a little bit of time, self-explanation as Danielle I'm sure will mention a little bit after me. Uh, has been shown to be really helpful in supporting students' meaningful comprehension, particularly in science. There's also a good deal of work um, in applied memory, talking about things like retrieval practice or the testing effect, showing that if you ask people to retrieve from memory, they will learn better and remember more. There's also work showing that if you ask students to explain from memory instead of just recalling what they remember, that's even better for learning. So we know that asking people to explain and as Nigel hinted at the end of his talk, asking people to explain about what they know and or potentially what they don't know is this useful way for us to help them increase their understanding and also potentially think about what they know and don't know in this very cool metacognitive way. I wasn't gonna talk about that, but now I'm thinking about it. So I'm really excited. I have some data literally sitting on my desk about metacognition and explanations. So very exciting. Um, but this is all to say, there are some limitations in using explanation strategies we know in the classroom. Um, part of it is that the benefits are dependent on the quality of the explanation that students are making. So what are the things we're trying to do is to help students to generate better explanations. So how do we do that? Um, and then the other problem is that um, we tend to underutilize these kinds of things in the classroom. So asking a student to explain as they read, asking them to write an explanation afterwards. And practically we can understand why that's harder. It takes students a longer time to write an explanation. It takes a teacher a longer time to grade or provide feedback on explanations. And so this is something that's been a little bit practically constraining for us. Um, but the good news is with a lot of the kinds of things that we're talking about today is we can use things like natural language processing to sort of both automate these processes and make it a bit faster and easier to implement. And also it can tell us a lot about what's actually going on cognitively. Um, so we've got a couple of different projects going on that we're trying to think about how we can use students' explanations to understand how it relates to their comprehension performance and then using that to drive interventions. Um, I'm gonna talk about one very simple study that we've done just to sort of play around to sort of demonstrate to you what I mean. So we had some students read science texts. We had them both self-explain as they were reading. And then afterward we said, great, now try to explain that to us. You have five minutes, write an explanation. We're gonna grade you, grade you on the quality of your explanation, not just how much you can remember. Um, and then afterwards we gave them a multiple choice test that included both memory items and some inference items that really require the student to deeply understand what the text was about. We took all of those explanations and we analyzed them with CRAT, which is the Constructed Response Assessment Tool. Um, and so what this is, is a natural language processing tool. We took a very um, bottom up approach here. We just took all of the indices, did a best feature match selection, and we use machine learning to predict comprehension outcomes based on the linguistic features of these explanations. Um, really quickly, what I can say is we were able to predict comprehension performance um, with a relatively limited set of features here. Again, we're using just what they said in their explanations. Um, and a pretty limited set of those kinds of features, uh, as it were. 
But what I really want to point out is that um, the self explanations that students wrote while they were reading were related to comprehension, but the kinds of features that were predictive were these descriptive features, so really adjective focused kinds of words. Whereas in the explanations that happened afterwards, those explanatory retrievals, um, the features that were related to comprehension were more about lexical sophistication. And so the more fancy words that students used or the more um, unfamiliar kinds of words students used, the more that predicted comprehension. And so from like a purely driving change and stealth assessment sort of way, this suggests we can use students' language to understand a little bit about how they will do on a comprehension test. But I think from a psychological, more like traditional psychology standpoint, this is suggesting to me that there's some differences in either the mechanisms or the processes that are going on concurrently and after the fact. And I think that that requires some additional uh, work that I'm really excited to think about. Um, and so what we're trying to do with this work, and again, I think Caitlin and Nigel both hinted at this really nicely, which is both doing A-B experimental kinds of designs to figure out well, which of these kinds of explanation strategies or activities work best for who? You can imagine practically asking people to explain a bunch of times as they go can get really exhausting. Who needs what, when? And we wanna isolate that and test it and look at it across um, different kinds of tasks. And the other thing that's exciting is thinking about this in the context of a classroom study. These were two tests and a test that happens immediately following. What does this look like in the bigger scheme of a classroom? Um, I'm going to stop and now veer off and talk about literature, which is a quite a bit different. Uh, but this is, has been my uh, interest for a really, really long time. I started graduate school wanting to know how people understand poetry, and it's gotten me here. Um, and so generally speaking, psychology has tended to shy away from authentic reading experiences. There's work on it. I'm not saying they haven't. But very generally, we tend to use textoids because they're nicely replicable. They're short. We can do, you know student comes into the lab and they read 24 texts in an hour kind of thing. Um, but often authentic reading requires more complex processes than that, that you can't quite capture in the lab. Um, I really like this term that Rolf Zwan uses. He calls texts either considerate or inconsiderate. And he talks about literary texts being especially inconsiderate. Uh, literary texts don't want to be replicable. <laughs> it's sort of their nature. Um, and really quickly, what we think people do when they're engaging in, in reading literature is they're trying to understand what the text means, what the author's trying to say, and understand how the text means it. So they're focusing on the language, they're trying to interpret a meaning. Um, something that's really challenging about literary reading is there's rarely, if ever, one right answer. Instead, there's a horizon of possibilities that this text could mean something, depending on if you're approaching it from a postmodernist lens or a feminist lens or you know, all of these different kinds of things you can do. Um, it tends to be really reliant on some affective processes that are going on. We want people to feel things when they read literature. Um, and so the general consensus, and I put this in quotations, is that literary comprehension interpretation is highly idiosyncratic and it's specific to a reader and it's specific to a text and it's really hard to think about these things as general constructs or general processes. Um, people who have done work in literary text comprehension tend to use small end studies and they tend to use a single text. I'm speaking in broad generalities here, they exist, but on the whole, that's what we really see. And I wanted to sort of challenge that. Uh, and so doing some work, uh, we took 346 essays that students wrote about two short stories that have deeper meanings. Um, and we had humans score each of the idea units within the essay for, is this something paraphrased directly from the text? Is this an inference about events or characters? Or is this an interpretive inference that goes beyond the story world that gets at these deeper meanings? This, this thing that feels very nebulous and sort of idiosyncratic. Um, and this time we took one of uh, a more theory driven approach and we picked on some linguistic indices and engrams we thought might be related to finding interpretations. Uh, we did some machine learning on it and I'm glossing over this very quickly to say we were able to do pretty good at predicting when people were interpreting versus paraphrasing. Um, it's a very simple way of thinking about these things, but what was exciting for me was there were patterns in the language just like we can use, is this a good summary? Does this get at the causal process in the science text that we know we can do? 
can we sort of do it for literature? And the answer is kind of in a very simple way. Um, and why I think this is really exciting and why I was excited to be here today is I think we have a really good opportunity to take these limitations that have happened in lab studies now that we have much bigger data to play with and learning analytics that have the power to do these kinds of things. Um, a lot of the work that's been done on educational data mining and, uh, and learning analytics has been with STEM courses, math courses, introductory course kinds of things. Um, there has been an explosion of online courses related to humanities, largely due to COVID and needing to do that. And there's so much data out there. Um, and so I think there's some really cool big data sets on authentic reading activities that are happening in literary classrooms and humanities classrooms. And the ability to get beyond these limitations of lab-based work to think about how these complex comprehension processes are unfolding for individual students and then thinking about how we can use that to drive feedback is something I'm really excited about. So, you know, I, I'm thinking both automated stuff and also human in the loop kinds of things. I know the question that's going to come up is, but are those interpretations any good? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'll just head that off right now. But I know I'm running out of time. And so I really just wanted to say what, what I'm excited about is this was some very preliminary work I've been thinking about. But thinking about and, and lab based work, how can we look at this in the context of, of longer time periods, more complex kinds of things, more texts, more types of readers. Um, and I've talked exclusively about what people have written down for me. Um, as we've talked about, there's lots of other kinds of data that we can be pulling on to think about how do we create good learner models and how does that help us explain comprehension and cognition um, more broadly. So I will leave it at that. Uh, thanks, Katie. We have a, a colleague who teaches uh, an LP course, uh, Professor Pete Smith, in our master's program, and he was texting me behind the scenes, uh, lauding uh, your presentation and selecting you to be on this uh, this panel. So it was well received by a fellow uh, text uh, researcher. Um, so quick question, we've got about another minute here. So I'll just tell this, Jerry, you read something uh, early on, right well, toward the end of your presentation, where you said, look, most of this work is being done on text. So you've got these small, distinct sort of elements of text you're working with, and you want that more whole holistic aspect. You want that bigger view. And one of the early stages, and Ryan Baker and I wrote a paper on this a number of years ago, was educational data mining focuses on sort of discrete granular relationships with learning analytics. We're trying to get this systemic integrated awareness of how the pieces fit together. In the last minute, what do you see learning analytics contributing to making that happen at a better scale, namely the holistic assessment rather than those discrete relationships? Yeah, that's, first of all, a question I don't think that I can appropriately answer. I think it's a really big question, uh, but I'll take a stab at it. And I think what we can do here is the idea that, that especially in the literature end of things, what's going on in literature is cognitive, but a very potentially limited view. If you want to think about affect, you want to think about culture, and you want to think about social and social context, and all those kinds of things. And so thinking about how we can use all of the pieces of a person in a context um, reading a particular text. The, a thing that I think is really fascinating about literature is, is we talk about how you can read as different, the same story at different points in your life and get something very different out of it. And that's from a lot of different components coming together. And I think only through these sort of holistic views of what's going on in a person's life and what they know and what they're experiencing in conjunction with the actual stimuli they're experiencing is the only way we can get at these sort of like very broad kinds of things for only looking at what they're doing for 20 minutes in a lab. I don't know that that's gonna ever be enough to fulfill the kinds of things that I think that like literature and those kinds of, and art have to offer us. Great, thanks very much, Katie. And we're rushing, but we're packing a lot in and we see this as sort of a larger conversation. Uh, Danielle, I think we have you up next. So if you wanna start sharing, that would be fantastic. You're muted. Yeah, just, yeah. You're still muted. Yeah. Muted. All right, we got the mute solved. <laughs> Are we here? Uh, am I in uh, presentation mode? No, I'm just seeing your desktop, not your oh, slides. Okay. Let's stop share. Let's start over.
Let's do that one. How's that? Is that better? Now I see you. Yep. Perfect. Take it away. Okay. Lovely. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to be changing, uh, ch changing directions just a little bit. Um, I normally, I think you might be uh, expecting me to talk about literacy or natural language processing or uh, something having to do even with self-explanation. Uh, today, uh, I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about a newer project um, called Learning at Scale. It's an ASU digital learning network platform funded by the uh, Institute for Education Sciences. And so to start us off, I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk a little bit about um, George's uh, last question on how to put the pieces together and the challenges that we face. So um, what we have here is uh, uh, my depiction of uh, a landscape of learning sciences and some of the questions that we have been attempting to uh, address. As you can see, even in, uh, you know, across the talks today, there are so many questions that we can ask about um, the contextual factors, learning context, ed tech affordances, what students do, the learning content, and then also the student factors. So um, what do we need to know about the student, their background, um, their affect, their proficiency in various aspects, attention, working memory, um, and uh, observables, like do, are they doing the homework? Are they reading the text? For how long are they reading the text? In, in learning sciences, we are uh, attempting to predict some sorts of uh, outcomes, a short-term, uh, immediate learning, long-term retention over time, transfer of learning, uh, often in, in, we're attempting to predict uh, academic success. There have been multiple challenges in putting these pieces together to see the multi-dimensional large picture of this. And one of this is the end. So how do we have enough participants at the same time using big data, having a, a large enough uh, sample and um, um, being able to do so both experimentally and with big data, both correlationally and with AB, uh, AB designs? Well, um, one of the ways that um, we are working on addressing that here is um, with ASU Learning at Scale. So what we're doing at the ASU is we have the Learning at Scale project to develop infrastructure and protocols to connect a wide range of data that's available in the ASU data ecosystem. And we have uh, so much data on achievement, learning, persistence, um, accessible, but it's not accessible to everyone, not accessible readily. So our goal is to make these data accessible to researchers, both within and outside of ASU. And in ways, one of our biggest challenges is to honor institutional and individual privacy. And we want to be able to share that data so that it can be examined both in exploratory and experimental methods. So our context is a ed plus. Um, it's an essential enterprise unit for ASU that's focused on the design and scalable uh, learning models to increase student success. One of the overarching objectives at ASU is to reduce barriers to achievement in higher education. It's kind of a theme at ASU. And Ed, Ed Plus serves more than 78,000 online degree seeking students. And that's across 100 um, countries. So it's very diverse. We also have um, uh, ASU uh, that's not online, which has even more students. So just to put this uh, kind of in a, a rough picture, you can imagine that we have student information systems, we have learning management systems, integrated learning tools, and um, the at, within the university as a whole. However, what we don't have is a means to put all this data together and to provide it easily 
to um, our to researchers. So we need to couple these data with various data sources and um, try to facilitate a holistic approach to looking at the data, and not only at single time points, but at multiple time points, so that we can enact, enact uh, actionable triggers when the student sig data signals a need for support, but also to understand learning. So to put together a more multi-dimensional uh, uh, picture of learning. We have many challenges. One of the biggest challenges we have is in, uh, at ASU and across multiple institutions that are facing this challenge is how to provide the data without violating individual and institutional privacy. Another is how to connect the data across multiple sources. So documenting data without necessi necessitating costly individual consulting to each team. And then linking the multiple tools to the LMS. So we have an LMS, we have tools. Sometimes we don't have, uh, we don't have the data from the LMS and sometimes we have difficulty in linking new tools to the LMS. And then most of all, it's really a person problem. How do we connect researchers to the ASU learning at scale? How do we connect researchers to instructors? How do we connect researchers to the academic units? And how do we facilitate that person problem? How do we uh, facilitate connecting people across these multiple uh, roles? So we have multiple challenges. And one of the challenges we wish to address as well is changes in the instructional practice. Often they have failed to demonstrate effectiveness across initial learning populations and context. In essence, we have somewhat of a replication crisis. And our challenge, one of the challenges overall that we're facing is how to replicate studies. My uh, stance is that it's not just the various e explanations that um, some have uh, explored, such as whether or not it's uh, being implemented correctly, but also really better understanding individual differences and differences in context. So one of the th ways that we are uh, building our tool is in implementing design uh, implementation framework. Um, many of the uh, participants in the building of the tool are um, very skilled in human factors. And we've been using this kind of approach for, uh, to develop uh, in intelligent tutoring systems for years. And in this, when we're, we're building our platform, we're going to be, um, engaging in participatory design and usability testing, which is iterative and circular. And where we're ideating our, um, our, our design, we're designing, we're conducting experiments, and then we're implementing. In year one, it's, uh, it involves a collaborative um, uh, partnership with ASU researchers, administration, instructors, and students, design meetings, focus groups. Um, in essence, we're really having um, a good time in uh, getting people together and collaborating and better understanding the landscape of ASU. In year two, we're going to be continuing our iterative design and platform components and uh, connecting our capacity to various uh, data and course features. In years three and five, we hope to, uh, we will be um, continuing the iterative design and then conducting small scale studies. This is a relatively small, pro small project uh, in the landscape of things where we hope to become uh, bigger and connect to other systems as well. Um, our platform, again, the main outcome that we're looking for is to understanding education and learning through feature and context rich uh, student data, and also to provide a model as others have done for public universities and best practices. This is the how. We've got a large project personnel uh, from multiple colleges, from Ed Plus, from systems in engineering, from science, um, and we are uh, really enjoying the collaborative process in, in building this platform.
We are part of the digital learning platforms uh, that's funded by IES. So in that, we are collaborating with Seernet, who is the um, lead uh, led by um, led led by Digital Promise, where there are five platforms that are currently funded to collaborate in how to accomplish this uh, fairly large goal. One of the things I wanna bring up is that um, overall, um, we need to face um, the silos in research. So what we have is, uh, what we've had across the last uh, 10, 20 years or so is researchers are one in one silo, educators are in another, and we have ed tech companies uh, in another, and we need to build pathways to link the researchers, edu ed educators, and industrial um, uh, institutions that are building ed tech. Um, and that's part of this goal, is to build uh, links between these various entities. So with that, I will close. Um, I have no idea if I'm on time or early, uh, but I am very excited to take questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Danielle. You're actually pretty much right on time, like to the minute. So uh, one of the things that's really interesting, and I'll just make a quick point. If anybody has questions, please type them in. Um, I'll just reference, uh, there's really it's an interesting overlap with the project. Uh, you, you've met uh, a colleague, Srechko Joksimovich. Uh, we recently did a paper on data for artificial intelligence research, where our interest is on how do you create the infrastructure for next generation analytics work? And not just analytics, but practice and impact, because you're not going to be able to do real-time interventions for students with the kind of data infrastructure that most universities have today. It sounds like there's good overlap there. Uh, and so maybe a follow-up conversation would be uh, would be warranted or just sharing respective papers, the one that you referenced and the one that I mentioned uh, that Srechko led on. A quick question, though, to, uh, before we, we uh, move over to Stephen. From, from your experience, and I like this, you know, the, the question about the silos, you know, we do have growing ed tech company presence in all aspects of the schooling sector from K to 12 through the university level. Uh, on the flip side, there's a lot of fantastic research opportunities that arise and Katie referenced this in her presentation as well that suddenly you've got this enormous amount of data that that's made available. With this platform that you're referencing is it primarily a research system from your end or is it more a practice and application system to grab, you know, to support the ed tech or the teaching activities or do you see it more as a basic scientific infrastructure i see it as both i think that without think of it thinking of it as a collaborative approach to um really accommodate both interests um it won't go forward so in thinking about and i also think um uh consider that uh experiments that are designed to improve learning should be thinking about how it can be implemented uh, at an institutional level or in the classroom. And so we really need to think about both parties. We really need to bring the instructors into the conversation. Uh, even the administrators, um, even the administrators, um, we need to bring uh, everyone into the conversation and think about how we can um, uh, meet the needs of our participants at various levels. At the same time, I am a scientist uh, at heart. And so uh, when I think about um, uh, the, um, the ultimate goal, uh, our ultimate goal is to better understand learning and to um, facilitate our ability to put together a multi-dimensional view of learning. Great, thanks very much, uh, Danielle. Um, I know we've, uh, we're still reasonably tight on time, but we're close to on our agenda. So Stephen, over to you. Yep, thanks, George. Um, so my name is Stephen Aguilar. I'm uh, currently an assistant professor of education at the USC Ross Cedar School of Education. Well, like a lot of folks here, I have a lot of hats. Um, and the hat that I'll be sort of using today is, is uh, as a motivation researcher um, and, and leveraging my training um, to really understand what it means to actually design some of these systems and what students may or may not take away from them, right? So to, to ground this approach, one of the things that I think is important to just lay out there is, is the theory that I use for a lot of my work, which is achievement goal theory. Now, 
essentially, if you if you look at the image or if you look at I, some of the items on the screen there, you'll you'll get a feel for for what this theory helps us understand, right? Which is that when students want to achieve something, they might set some goals and, and some motivational goals, and some of those goals will be dictated by, you know, what motivates them, right? So if you're a performance avoid uh, student, then you 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 don't want to fail relative to your peers, right? Whereas if you're a performance approach, you want to do better than other folks, right? Which is, and that's characterized by the two folks racing here, right? The performance avoid person is angry that he's that he's not doing as well as, as the person in front of him. Whereas if you're mastery oriented, you just want to learn. You, you, you're not even attending to what other folks are doing, right? So um, these are the sort of the three dimensions. It, it's a technically a two by two uh, theory, but I use these three dimensions specifically in, when I'm looking at my work. and when I think about how it fits within sort of learning analytics broadly, because it's it's a growing field and a lot of folks, even even in this, uh, during this talk today, you, you saw a lot of different approaches to, you know, what it means to do research and learning analytics. I focus a lot of it on sort of this idea of personalization of the learning environment and, and what we communicate to students. Um, because I think ultimately, you know, there there's the basic science of it, which is how we can use a lot of the data that we're gathering to understand student learning, student behavior, how we can shape it. And it's in that latter um, approach that I think it's important for us to, to, to be very mindful of what we're doing, right? So how, how can we shape student behavior either explicitly trying to or, or sort of not knowing that we're doing it? Um, so some of my early work here was, was looking at personalization with respect to, you know, different dashboards, right? And, and the dashboard that you see in front of me is, you know, like if there's any Michigan folks in the audience, this is old. I know that this is not what Student Explorer looks like anymore. But back in, in, in sort of the mid 2010s, I guess now, um, there was this idea that um, if you were an advisor and you wanted to sort of help students understand how they were doing it during a summer bridge course that you would want to sort of potentially see how they stacked up against their peers, right? This idea of constant comparison to, to under, see how, how students are achieving was, um, wasn't, and to some extent still is sort of a, a, a popular notion, at least in education, but sometimes in, in the way that we communicate this information to students. So this study, um, I, was, I was primarily interested in sort of understanding the relationship between student motivation and incidental exposure to visualizations, right? That this dashboard wasn't actually designed for, for as a student facing system, but, through through a sort of a confluence of a lot of really uh, promising data sources, we were able to, to detect whether or not a student was present in the room while an advisor was looking at their specific information. And we characterize this as, as potential incidental exposure, right? So it, you know, the screen could have been just facing the advisor and not the student, or the advisor could have turned it around and shown the student. Um, so you know, without getting into too many of the details, I don't want, I want to sort of stay high level here and, and not get into the weeds too much. Um, we found that students sort of incidental exposure sort of negatively predicted the change in their mastery orientation over a six week term, right? So this is, this is a short term, but we found that even sort of just being present as an advisor was using the system, either th through the way that the, the advisor was characterizing it, the, the, there, it's, it's not possible to know exactly what that interaction looked like. But we do know that they were there together looking at the and student uh, and the student explorer system was being used at the time right so so we know that something happened um and this sort of predicted the ch change in, in mastery orientation and later on we we did a similar study again um this time we we looked at you know whether or not students were actually comparing themselves to the performance of their peers and again we found that similarly if they, they were in the same room together and in uh and the advisor and the student were sort of the advisor was using student explorer that they again there was sort of this relationship and, and just to, to head to anticipate questions all of the work that i will be uh, discussing today is sort of correlational in design um i have done some experimental work that's currently under review that that i'll, I'll be happy to talk about but but right now I'm, I'm basically looking at sort of what happens when students are you know what are, what do these relationships look like um so this sort of gets me to really the, the crux of what, why this work is important, to at least why I think it's important, um, which is this notion of, uh, you know, it's an old idea, right, of perceived affordances, right? So when you see a door with the flat, you know, with, with the flat edge, you want to push it, whereas we, when you see a door with a handle, you want to grab it and pull it, 
and, and this is sort of the, this idea of a perceived affordance of a, you know, of a physical technology, but when we're doing learning analytics work, we, we are designing, you know, technologies that have perceived affordances, even if we don't do it intentionally. And, and that's sort of that, that's, that's my key point um, for, for this talk. And when we're thinking about motivation specifically and what happens when a student sees some information about their academic achievements specifically, is that whether or not we, we uh, are intentional, there, there will be some perceived affordances to what students see. And we have to be very, it's better to be actually intentional in this regard rather than just do something and, and not sort of pay attention to, to how students are interpreting what we've done. Um, so I explored, I've also sort of explored this idea qualitatively, right? Which is when you present students with different types of visual, you know, very simple visualizations of their academic performance. In this case, I'll show you sort of line graphs depicting uh, various academic scenarios. Um, what do students see? What do they tell me they saw? Um, versus, you know, what, what potentially is, is, was the intent of the design, right? So I used, uh, just very simple line graphs that you, you can't really see the, the, um, the X and Y axis there, but the X is time, right? So it's week one through week 14 of an academic term and the Y axis is great, right? So, so immediately you can see that. So if you're looking at the left-hand side, you're doing better over time or you're doing better than you tank if you're looking at the bottom. And then the, the three graphs on the right-hand side, same information, but now I've added a comparative element where you also see how other students are, are doing. Now, immediately you'll see that this is, a, this is an artificial scenario, right? The lines don't necessarily behave this way when you're, um, when you're using actual data. But the, but the idea here was, wasn't to, to give students sort of actual information, but it was to capture sort of their own interpretation of these perceived, potential perceived affordances of these visualizations of academic information. So it's important to know who these students were. Um, they were all first-generation college students. Um, they came from low SES backgrounds. They attended low-performing high schools. These were all summer bridge students. And I won't read all these bullet points here, but these were the factors that were uh, important for their inclusion in the summer bridge program. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's sort of um, gone unsaid here is, is that often when, we, when we're so a lot of the work in, in learning analytics has been about how to detect, predict, intervene on students who are at risk of academic failure, academic challenges. There's lots of different words that we use, but students who are struggling. And if, if that's sort of one of the goals, I know there are many goals, but if that's one of the goals of, of doing this work, then it's important to sort of you know, talk to these students um, and, and see how they're doing and how they're interpreting information. So again, I, I wanted to see what the perceived affordances of these graphs were. And this is, this is I'll linger here for a little bit because this is, this is what students saw, right? So at the time, and this is a fairly dense visualization um, that's probably not that well designed, but I'll talk through it. So at the top, you see different graphs, um, what students were seeing. The bar graphs, it's a stack bar chart in terms of whether or not students thought that that graph was mastery oriented, um, performance oriented, just generally, right? Which meant they made some sort of comparison um, to their peers. Performance avoid, meaning again, going back to that race uh, sort of image, they saw that they didn't want to do as poorly as compared to their peers or if they were performance approach oriented, which meant they wanted to do better than their peers. So you saw here that with, you know, the findings are, are sort of, um, you, you, can you, know, you can anticipate what they were, right? If it's just one line, then it should signal that it's you know it is a it is a mastery line. It's just your information. There's no comparative element to attend to. Um, but even even with that, you see sort of some low ends, right? So three students still saw just the singular line that was upward trending as containing some sort of performance information. You see that change dramatically in the second bar graph, where you see um, that there's a lot more and, and there should be right because it, it, there are two there are two lines. Um, and students were sort of correctly interpreting that there, there was some sort of performance, performance orientation, either performance avoid, performance approach, right? It signaled that students should be thinking about comparisons. Now I have here, uh, for the interest of time, I didn't, I didn't sort of pull out quotes, um, but importantly, students, when, when, when I asked them sort of to talk a little bit about it, they were very conscious of Attend, you know, they were they were signaling lots of different things. Some of the identity oriented, right? I'm not this type of student that would do poorly, or um, other factors that we know are important for student motivation in terms of you know having you know a sense of belonging in sort of the community. Um, 
which is a different theory, right? That's that self-determination theory. But again, this is sort of broadly speaking what, what motivation can tell us about the things that we ought to ought to be thinking about when we're when we're when we're actually designing these learning analytics dashboards that that many of us often endeavor to do, or at very least to George's point, when there is a translation layer, often it's through um, sort of a dashboard element that sort of signals to the user what they should be taking away from all the data and all the all the all the computations that we've done on the back end. Um, so you know there are two main findings, right? Which 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 again are might might sort of sound self-explanatory, um, which is self-focused graphs lended themselves to mastery-focused interpretations, right? If there was just one line, most students thought it was just about them, which is what that line should have signaled. Um, whereas comparative graphs lent themselves to performance interpretations. Again, that that is what one would expect. Um, but it's the nature of, of what happens after that that's important, right? So later on in 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 when I was um, sort of investigating this work uh, in it through sort of a more quantitative lens, is I developed uh, what I call the motivation information seeking questionnaire, which is again grounded in this uh, in the achievement goal theory tradition. But rather than sort of having the goal be academic achievement, the goal was what sort of information do you seek, right? So am I the type of student that wants to see mastery information? Or am I the type of student that wants to see performance information? And th this is what, 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 that, what, that, um, what that measure uh, measured. Um, with a little caveat that, that, that it really is more, more of a performance uh, approach and performance avoid measure because the the mastery items didn't really didn't really cohere in ways that make makes it a useful measure for those for those items psychometrically. Um, so yeah, so so basically when when I when I you know sent this out to college students, again, we we saw that um, students who wanted to see performance approach information um, wanted to compare themselves with their peers. Now often uh, this is in the literature this, could, this this is a bit of a double-edged sword right it, it can be characterized as negative right um, performance avoid um, tendencies can lead to cheating behavior or, or, or behavior that we don't want students to do right if because if, if my goal is to just do better than my peers well then I can cheat and do that I don't need to actually learn anything um, However, if I'm super competitive and I just, you know, if you think of a leaderboard and I want to sort of outperform my peers and I might actually dig in and just learn more just to do better than everyone else. And that might be okay. Um, and, and that's something that, that, that I'm digging into currently in, in some current work, which is what happens when I manipulate some of these visualizations experimentally and how does it change how students are interpreting their own achievements. Um, so I want to end with just a couple of general guidelines that, that I think are important. Um, which is, which is to be mindful of, of, of what we're doing when we're communi communicating information to students and to others, but students specifically, because they're sort of a, to, to, to um, Danielle's earlier point, right? If we're doing this work, we have to be attentive to privacy concerns, but also to other implications of, of what happens when, when students who don't have the influence to shape these technologies necessarily or shape the policies around them. If they don't have sort of that, in, that influence, then we need to be mindful of it. So, you know, don't assume that more information is always going to be going to be better, right? The, the late Stuart Karabenek, who was my advisor at Michigan, this was a refrain that we often um, said is, is you just because we have it doesn't mean that it's useful. Um, anticipate and mitigate against potential uh, misinterpretations, right? Or harmful alternative interpretations, right? Do the work in terms of, of, of what it is students might need to see in order for this for whatever information to be effective. And regardless of one and two, make sure that there's a pathway forward for students, right? Give them give them something to do to better themselves or to, to, to sort of engage with the content so they're not um, sort of stuck at, with sort of a, a information that says that they're doing well or not doing well, and there's not much for them to do after that, right? The, 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 the goal of, of personalization should be that we can sort of provide these personalized pathways to success and to, to mastery of, of, in, of academic content. Um, so let, yeah, one of the things I, I push for is let, let's do, let's do actually do that. Let's connect them to resources. Um, 
So that's it. That that was my All last right. slide. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. I think we'll we uh, we've got eight minutes left for general questions. Um, so for the okay. tail end of the the discussion here. So why don't I start? Uh, just if anybody has questions across, you've now heard, uh, you know, a number of insightful uh, and informed uh, presentations around the potential intersection with AI with learning analytics and uh, psychology as a research domain. So if anyone has questions, please uh, drop them into the chat area. Um, Justin, if you can just uh, drop in the link to our session coming up at the end of the month uh, around big data and um, you know, research in uh, psychology. That would be great to have listed as well. Uh, I'm also going to drop in, some of you may be interested, we have an open online conference that is being coordinated. We have colleagues really from around the world and also uh, you know, uh, some of the people involved in our call here around empowering learners for the age of AI. It's our second event. Uh, we'll have uh, speakers and panelists from, from really around the world coming on and um, we have all, uh, there's a couple of huge NSF AI and learning grants that you're aware of that have recently been funded. They'll also be represented during, uh, as keynotes, at least two, uh, University of North Carolina and the Georgia uh, Center. We had uh, Sidney DeMello uh, last year at the same conference speaking. So if you're interested, it's free registration and it's just in, in the link uh, listed in, in your chat area. So one of the questions is a general one to the group. I'm see not seeing specific questions right now, even though there's one I think that Tobias asked of Stephen. So I'll let Stephen answer that via text. But one of the questions that we're facing, so the data that we use, and this is a big problem in any kind of AI, machine learning, learning analytics approach, which is our data is historical, which means we're always dealing with backward looking data as a general rule in the models we build or in the kinds of work that we're doing. Unfortunately, that backward looking data frequently includes a number of issues, which can be bias. Uh, there's be probably all heard about Amazon uh, has a hiring algorithm that is inherently sexist, if you will, or you can have college admissions guidelines that similarly uh, are based on historical data that end up uh, producing uh, racist, sexist, or other problematic outcomes for students who are applying. So can I throw this as a general question to anyone here, when you're doing work that sits at this intersection of psychology and learning analytics, how do you uh, keep that front and center so that we're not perpetuating uh, some of the existing inefficiencies that we see in the education sector. And that's an open question to whoever wants to grab the mic first. Uh, I'll jump in there, especially because I have to leave in one minute to go teach online. Um, but I think there's really two questions there, one of which is about the potential for bias in machine learning algorithms, given that they are um, uh, often based on data that encode uh, social biases. Um, and there's certainly a lot of research, interesting work on how um, studying how biases like that creep in and how we might uh, reduce them in AI driven systems and even use AI to reduce those in, in society. But then there's a separate question also of uh, uh, what happens when your data change over time because they're all historical and uh, the world is constantly changing, especially in computer based learning. Uh, so what if your data don't reflect, um, uh, are no longer accurate for the way that the world is now? Um, and th there's an interesting research on the uh, 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 data shift or data drift, I guess it's called, on how to try to combat that, um, which I don't, haven't seen much of that in learning analytics, but there's uh, probably opportunities to learn from the uh, machine learning community on how to uh, address that specific type of problem, as well as the importance of experimentally evaluating uh, what Caitlin talked about to determine what is the, the actual effect of an intervention versus what you might expect it to be based on your machine learning model accuracy that might not actually hold um, now that the world is different than when you collected your training data. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly just jump in on, on, on sort of the notion of bias and data. and. One of, one of the things I think is, is that we need to be careful about is that the, the idea that data can ever be objective in any meaningful way is I think a fantasy. Um, so, and, and what I mean specifically is that we, we constantly do sort of quantify the, what, you know, what's possible, right? So in golf people, you know, golfers have handicaps, right? It, it, it's a numer numerical value that says, you know, what's their potential in, in a given course or that quantifies their ability. So instead of, of sort of chasing this idea that we can actually be truly objective, it would actually, I think, be more useful to just really understand our data on its terms and set boundaries on what it can and can't say. Because I think what happens often is that we sort of over 
we, we think our data can do more than it can. And sometimes that's through a blind spot, right? If, if your team all is trained in the same way, comes from the same places, comes from the same traditions, then you will all have the same blind spots. So that actually points to the need to, to, to Danielle's point, to create these, these places. And, and this is gonna be industry versus academia to, to create these pathways where we can all talk to one another and understand the boundaries of the work that we're doing so that we don't get into these traps of overselling what our data can do and underestimating what it can't. I'll jump in here. Um, uh, we're addressing this from multiple perspectives. One, we're, we're focusing on it in uh, multiple projects um, as uh, by uh, including people who will focus on diversity. I think this is, um, we do need to think about multiple aspects of it. One is it from AI, when we're developing our algorithms, we need to make sure that it, um, they extend past our original population or into for the subpopulations. We need to look at the extent to which we are um, generalizing to multiple uh, populations by going beyond just doing a uh, training and test sets, but actually creating completely separate um, test beds for the AI. Another has to do with making our data more accessible to um, researchers who do not have, traditionally do not have access. It really does um, have to do with how we, the questions we ask. So the questions that we ask are if they're completely driven, driven by people who traditionally have access to that data, the, the questions will be different. And so um, uh, just as uh, Stephen just said, um, it is important that we build these platforms that and access to data that can be um, uh, accessed by uh, multiple communities, but also that we work to provide the training necessary to do so. So workshops like this, workshops on uh, learning how to do AI, learning how to build educational technologies and how to use them. So all of this coming together from multiple perspectives is needed in order to address issues that we have regarding diversity. And great, thanks. I'm going to ask one, two questions, uh, and I will throw one to Katie and one to Caitlin. Um, so, um, and I, I will throw Katie yours first, which I'm looking at the idea of what can we, uh, you're talking to a, a new student in learning analytics, and you're saying, hey, here's what I'd like you to know about psychology research. And Caitlin, you're getting the flip side from learning analytics end in a second. What would you want this student to know? You're just really coming at them with the tough questions, George. I like it. Um, I'm going to actually just turn and I want to follow up with something that Danielle said very, very quickly because she talked about the way that, that we're getting the right people looking at the data. I also want to point out that I think we need to be doing better at collecting data from a lot of people. Big data is great, but if it's the same type of people generating that big data, think about how many people who don't have internet access right now, don't have reliable internet access, and what are we not knowing about those students? So that's like a, a sticking point for me. And I just, if I don't say it, I'll hate myself. So Sorry, completely veered off of that question, um, but it was something I was thinking about. And um, what do I want a psychology student to know about learning analytics? Um, I think that I actually want my students to know they're actually already doing learning analytics, they just don't know it. Um, when we think about this stuff and I look at what we think about of collecting data and making sense of it and trying to, to understand what learning how learning happens, everything we collect is data and it is learning analytics, it's just in the lab in a small scale, the way that we're doing it now and thinking about it at scale and thinking about it in C2 is different questions that require different things. But I think they, many of my students think of it, it is all it is, is you have to learn computer science and you have to do the machine learning. And that is skills that I would like my students to learn. But I think you're already doing it. And you already have these great questions that can be answered with other types of data and other methodologies. And you, you know those things. And I think that's a really important thing for students to recognize that it's not a complete turn of, of what you're asking or your knowledge base. It's just grabbing something new and taking it and, and expanding what you're capable of asking and answering. Mm 
Okay, thanks, Katie. Uh, then I will direct last question as we are a little over time to uh, Caitlin. If you were speaking to someone um, you know, in the learning analytics field, what would you want them to know about psychology? I guess the same thing that Katie is saying in some ways, it's just like, it, it's, I think, I think probably, you know, learning analytics is great because it is really interdisciplinary. And, I, but I think to what you should know about, I think asking the question about what can you learn from psychology, you know, some of the a theoretical models are also really useful, but, but trying to figure out if there are theories that we do have a lot of mechanistic explanations for that exist in psychology, how would they be relevant to learning analytics? They may not be relevant for some of the reasons that Danielle and Katie and Stephen have mentioned, um, but but if they're not relevant or if you think there are ways to improve them, then like what, what can you also, you know, then, then inform psychology about as well. Um, so anyway, I have to run to class as well, but this was really great. So thanks again for hosting and uh, good to see everybody. All right. On that note, thanks to all the panelists uh, and thanks for, for everybody who attended. We have a couple of upcoming events that will follow up by email to this list as well that you may want to sign up for. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining everyone. Thank you.